Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar about legislative updates. I'm Rosemary Cundit, and I'm going to talk about the updates to the Government Records Access and Management Act, GRANDMA, and then Paul Tonks, who represents the uh, archives at the Attorney General's office, is going to talk about the updates to the Open Public Meetings Act. Just thinking about updates reminded me that 10 years ago in 2012, one of the legislative updates was the creation of the position of government records ombudsman and tag you're it, I got appointed to that position and it's been 10 years. There have been legislative updates every year since then and there are a few this year. So we'll just work through them and and uh, you can ask questions at the end. So the first section of grandma that was changed this year is uh, 63 G2106. And this section talks about how records regarding security measures that are designed for the protection of persons or property, whether public or private, are not subject to grandma. So this section gives some examples like security plans, security codes and combinations, passwords, passes and keys, and so on. And I interpret this to mean that these are examples of security measures, but are not all inclusive. So this was expanded to provide more examples this year. So part of the legislative discussion in expanding this was that Utah has not done enough to protect the safety of drinking, drinking water and wastewater systems. And so we added that security plans include security plans that are prepared to mitigate terrorist terrorist activity or emergency and disaster response and recovery plans. And then except as provided in subsection three, the results of or data collected from a public entity's risk assessment or security audit. And then it goes on to say that the records described here do not include a certification that a culinary water system has conducted a risk and resilience assessment. So while the public can know that culinary water system has conducted a risk and resilience assessment, they don't get to know the data that was collected behind that or all of the, uh, the details of that. So whereas going back to the first part, security plans. Whereas it already said security plans, now it's defined to include security plans for disaster response and recovery or to mitigate terrorist activity. So, you know, we spend a lot of time planning for disaster and figuring out what we'll do, where we'll meet. The archives has a calling tree, for example, but all of those are now specifically defined as part of security plans that are not subject to grandma. This same bill added another category of protected records. So on the list of protected records, we now have specifically an engineering or architectural drawing of drinking water or waste water facility. And except as provided in 106, a record detailing the tools or procedures the drinking water or wastewater facility uses to secure or prohibit access to these records. So that's measures taken to, to secure our drinking water and wastewater facilities and to make sure that those are protected or not subject to grandma. 
either way, not disclosed. The next section that was changed this year is 103, and it's actually, uh, that's wrong. It's 203. So when a, a government governmental entity compiles a record in response to a request in a format that is not normally maintained, the governmental entity can charge a reasonable fee for processing that request. And then it goes on to say that for time spent, the hourly charge cannot exceed the wage of the lowest paid employee who is capable of doing that work. And then notwithstanding, uh, no charge can be made for the first quarter hour of staff time. So that, that particular part, the first quarter hour of staff time is the focus of the change this year. So uh, gosh, in the last couple of years and throughout the legislative session, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what to do with vexatious requesters. They, you know, how do we, how do we deal with people who use grandma requests to inappropriately to antagonize or to whatever. So there was talk about, you know, identifying vexatious requesters and the records committee could uh, designate them and limit their rights and other, other suggestions, but these, it's really difficult to come up with something to address this. So in House Bill uh, 96, the uh, legislature decided that we could, uh, I'll get to that, but we could um, charge for the first 15 minutes so then the discussion led to discussion about, but journalists make numerous requests and they're not vexatious requesters. So let's look at what the language is that resulted from this legislation. So notwithstanding subsection 5B3, and that's the subsection that says that you cannot charge for the first 15 minutes. A governmental entity is not prevented from charging a fee for the first quarter hour of staff time spent in responding to a request if the person who submits the request is not a media representative and previously submitted a separate request within the 10-day period immediately before the date of the request to which the governmental entity is responding. So. That means if someone submits a, more than one request within a 10-day period, then you can charge for the first 15 minutes of staff time for responding to the subsequent request beyond the first one. So since the legislature wants to accept the media, we have to define what a media representative is. So this section 203 goes on to say that a media representative means a person who requested a record to obtain information for a story or report for publication or broadcast to the general public. And it does not include a person who requests a record to obtain information for a blog, podcast, social media account, or other means of mass communication generally available to a member of the public. So this is pretty clear that it, it, it means reporters for the Tribune or other reputable broadcasting companies and not just anybody with a blog who could uh, publish something. So that's, that's the change with regard to fees for processing grammar requests. There were a couple of additions to the list of private records. 
So the legislature created a child welfare legislation oversight panel. And this panel is made up of legislators and they, they focus on child welfare. But in this specific addition to the list of private records, they specified that a record of the child welfare, welfare legislative oversight panel regarding an individual child welfare case is private. So when this committee starts talking about an, an individual child's case, those records are private. The next, uh, the next addition to the list of private records is records involving alcohol or drug tests administered to state employees. So depending on the nature of the job, some state employees are required to get drug tests, sometimes based on a particular situation of someone else. Other employees are also required to get drug tests. And now we are specifically identifying those records related to those drug or alcohol tests that are administered to state employees are private records. So there were also additions this year to the list of protected records. So number 46 already states that records provided by any pawn shop or secondhand business to a law enforcement agency or to the central database are protected records. So the state has a database where they keep track of pawn shop transactions and secondhand merchandise transactions. And this has now been changed to include uh, catal catalytic converters. I don't know much about catalytic converters, but more broadly, the legislature has added catalytic converters to this uh, database. So we're now tracking the, the sale and per purchase and sale of catalytic converters. And so if law enforcement agencies obtain that information, it's protected. This is quite specific, but the next category of protected records that was changed this year is uh, 30581. Now, this particular protected record was added just last year. So an image taken of an individual during the process of booking the individual into jail. So that's not just the formal jail booking photo, but any images taken of an individual during the booking process. So then there were some exceptions carved out. If the individual is convicted of a criminal offense based on his conduct associated with the, that image that was taken, or uh, if a law enforcement agency releases or disseminates the picture in order to determine if, uh, if the individual is a fugitive and, the, and poses an imminent threat and they can release the picture in order to try to apprehend that person or reduce the threat. Or if a court order, order releases uh, this photo. So those are the three basic reasons a court order, a law enforcement, or if the individual was convicted of a crime associated with that photo. So this year, this has been expanded to include an additional reason law enforcement may release the photo 
to a potential witness or other individual with direct knowledge of events relevant to the criminal investigation or criminal proceeding for the purpose of locating an individual in connection with the criminal investigation or the criminal proceeding. So this basically expands the reasons that law enforcement agencies can release a photo if in the process of doing a criminal investigation they can release it to individuals who might be able to identify a suspect. We have a question. Yes. From Sherry Maxwell. 63G-2-30581, will this include an in-tox room and pre-booking jail video? Yes, that's a good question. If we go back to, it says an image taken of an individual during the process of booking the individual into jail. That, I mean, the literal language includes any image taken of an individual during the process of booking in jail. So I would interpret that literally, but uh, Paul Tonks is not in the room right now, but we can ask him when he comes back and see what his opinion is about that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So House Bill 399 addressed Garrity statements. And let's see, I wanted to talk about this a little bit. A lot of times, new legislation comes out of some kind of litigation or it, you know, something happens to trigger this litigation. But last year, uh, the press, in particular, there was a reporter, Sam, Sam Steklo, who made a lot of records requests associating with, associated with officer involved shootings. And actually in May, we had a special day when the Records Committee just heard Sam Stecklow appeals to various law enforcement agencies. And just for example, in one particular case, the West Valley Police Department, they responded to Sam's requests for records involving officer involved shootings with the statement that they had only one case that was responsive and they would not disclose that because the officer uh, the officer involved had made the statements under Garrity. So uh, I think Garrity just means that a governmental entity can compel an employee to make statements, but because they were compelled to make the statements, the statements that incriminate them cannot be used against them because of the fact that they were compelled to make those statements. So the uh, West Jordan Police Department said that the Garrity statements were private based on uh, 302-2B, which says that employment records such as performance evaluations, et cetera, are private records. They use 302 2D, which is clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. They also said that the Garrity statements were protected under 30510, which protects uh, records that would interfere with an investigation or could interfere with someone's right to a fair trial. And they also protected them under 18, which is records created in anticipation of litigation. And so they had multiple reasons for protecting these Garrity statements. However, the Records Committee uh, the Records Committee uh, provided a rule that West Jordan should provide access to these statements, that the public interest in understanding and knowing about the officer-involved shootings 
and this particular case was greater than the public interest, greater than the private interest or the public interest in protecting the records. So um, this was appealed in district court. And as a result of this and possibly others, now have 305, a new protected record, which is a statement that an employee of a governmental entity provides to the governmental entity as part of the governmental entity's personnel or administrative investigation into potential misconduct involving the employee. If the governmental entity requires a statement under threat of employment disciplinary action, including possible termination of employment, for the employee's refusal to provide the statement and provides the employee with assurance that the statement cannot be used against the employee in any criminal proceeding. So I think that kind of summarizes what Garrity's statement is. And that is protected. This same bill expanded uh, this district court may enjoin a governmental entity that violates the provisions of grandma. So in 801, excuse me, 802, a district court may enjoin any governmental entity that violates or proposes to violate the provisions of this chapter. So this is saying that if, uh, if a records access issue goes to district court and the requester substantially prevails, the government entity loses at the district court, then uh, the court can uh, award attorney fees to the requester and the governmental entity would then have to pay those attorney fees. So, <laughs> The attorney fees and costs are not subject to the Governmental Immunity Act. So this is uh, was added to 405, except for the waiver of immunity in subsection 63G 7301-2E, a claim for attorney fees or costs under this section is not subject to the Governmental Immunity Act. So I am not that familiar. We can also ask Paul about this in a moment. But uh, I think the government, the Governmental Immunity Act essentially just means that governmental entities and government employees cannot be sued for damages that occur as a result of them just carrying out their government functions. So uh, that's all of the uh, updates to Grandma this year. There are a few other minor ones that are specific to, that are really specific, but this is, um, this is what got updated this year. And if anyone has any questions, uh, I would like to ask Paul, to talk a little bit about the litigation associated with this Bill 399 and the, the Garrity and the attorney fees issues. Mm -hmm. and I'm not in the room right now, but we're going to grab him. All right, where are we? So I just promised that you would make a few comments off the top of your head about the litigation related to the Garrity and also the litigation regarding to attorney regarding attorney fees. And I know those are two separate issues, but could you just comment Absolutely. about those? Absolutely. Because they ended up in litigation, I mean in legislation yeah. over this yeah. in the same bill. And and that's that's one of those really interesting ones that we had with the State Records Committee, both both issues. Um the Garrity issue is one that as a matter of fact the State Records Committee took and see is the camera there or is the camera there? <laughs> it's right here. Camera's right here. Whoever's talking. Um, 
And, and so the State Records Committee actually addressed it directly and had a whole day of nothing but Garrity cases uh, right. because the Salt Lake Tribune made a request for Garrity interviews from many different uh, political subdivisions, um, cities, counties, anyone that, that has basically a police department. Uh, they received probably about 80% of them, uh, but then there were six that said, mm, we don't think we should release these. And so those six came before the State Records Committee and the Re State Records Committee found that the Garrity statements, there wasn't something in grandma that protected them from being released to the public. Well, they well they found things in grandma, but the records committee didn't hear it. They, they didn't. Well, <laughs> the police departments, of course, you know, had their arguments why in grandma. Exactly. The state records committee did not find that they were valid enough arguments. Um, so for those cases were uh, appealed to district courts. Uh, we are down actually to only one case, uh, which mm -hmm. is involving uh, the West Jordan Police Department. Uh, there is a settlement agreement that's being taken care of in Washington County, St. George one. Um, but the reason why it's a very interesting issue is because with, with Garrity, basically you have this um, interview that takes place. And Garrity is, is a U.S. Supreme Court case. It very so I think, for example, Miranda. You have your Miranda warnings given to you. You have the right to remain silent. Whatever you say can or could be used against you. Uh, Gary is a Supreme Court case that basically says if the police department is investigating something that happened or actually any employee, a government employee, something happened and the employee says, well, I don't want to say anything because I have a Fifth Amendment privilege to not incriminate myself. But there's also this, uh, shall we say, overriding interest by the government to want to have the information because they need to find out what happened. So say a police shooting happens. Um, the officer being prosecuted is one thing if in case the officer did something wrong, but the government needs to know what's going on. Um, this will include in talks room and pre yeah, so this is, I mean, this is, is very, very broad. And so it's, it's so important that we get the information what exactly happened in the shooting that according to Garrity, uh, they, they will tell them whatever you say will not be used against you in a criminal prosecution because we want you to say whatever happens, every detail. And that's an important part um, because the Garrity case basically was the governmental entity said, if you don't tell us and you assert your Fifth Amendment privilege, you're fired. And the U.S. Supreme Court thought that's kind of harsh because all of a sudden you, you put someone uh, in a rock and a hard place between do I tell what happened but potentially incriminate myself or not say and then lose my job. And so between those two, and that's, that's why you have that kind of Garrity protection. And so a lot of people are pretty much kind of told when they, they come in is that this information is never gonna come out. But oftentimes you find it in grandma, just because someone says it's private, it'll never get out. It, it, it has the to go by what's in the statute. Decide otherwise. Records committee, so for example, police shootings is something that is um, of great public interest. And the Salt Lake Tribune wanted to look at all the police shootings in the in the the, the state, and um, the committee on some some of those cases basically found that the public interest was greater than what the interest was of keeping it private. So, uh, what happened this last session is that uh, we had the legislature get involved, and they actually passed uh, a change into Grandma that, that basically said Gary these Gary statements, without actually saying Gary statements. I don't think they say it in the statute saying that they are protected, but they also give a provision that kind of allows those to come out in that wing provision uh, for news media. So um, it doesn't really change much if, if you really think about what's what's in there, but it's it's one of those you know, great, you know, classic, I would say classic grandma cases, where it's, it's classic in that, you know, we have this public interest. We want to know what happened. This is our police officers. This is you know, someone's life might, may have ended because of this. But then you have the, the, the very important interest of the police officers in, in trying to keep some of this information. Um, and and these, these were public, um, at least at this portion, the, the police officers were, were deposed and, and one of them really kind of choked up and when he was being deposed, he says, I, I don't know if I want my daughter to know the details of what happened. I, I don't want these things coming out. So it's, it's very personal, very private. And so you have very strong opinions on both sides. And uh, just because the legislature did something about it this time, I think we'll probably still see the issues coming up, uh, in part because it is an issue of, of great importance, definitely.
Okay. And the other one was, let's see, other than Gary, what was the other? The other one was the, the attorney fees. And that yeah. was the Big Game Forever case. Yeah. Um, so Big Game Forever was, was quite interesting. And this is this is kind of making the rounds of a lot of government entities. Is because you had a contract. And Big Game Forever said that in this contract, um, this it, it needs to remain protected. Because we believe there are trade secrets. Um, the state records committee disagreed. They said, no, there's no trade secrets. It's, it's basically it's a contract. The, the elements of the contract are public. So big game filed an appeal with district court. And the governmental entity, which we're not going to name here, we'll just leave them out, um, they came along as well. And they supported and said, well, you know, they were the ones that had the contract. We're going to support you. We're still going to hold on to this record. The problem is, is that when it got to the district court level, the district court found in favor of Salt Lake Tribune, which was trying to get the information. And and Salt Lake Tribune said, well, we are a motion for attorney fees because we won. And we substantially won. And they didn't have a good argument to, to back up why these records shouldn't be released. They're not trade secrets. You found this. The state records couldn't found this. And then the trial court said, OK, um, the government entity and big trade, uh, big game, you owe attorney fees, and it's like $150,000 because Salt Lake Tribune has expensive attorneys. And, <laughs> and it's just all of a sudden this thought of you know, be very careful because if you're going, and, and the judge's reason was, was quite simple. Um, even though it was big game forever that filed the appeal, the government entity is the one that held the record. They were the ones that had the record and could have made a determination at any point, you know what, this. This is not a good argument on the point of uh, big game. We should just release the record, and they didn't. And so they were held equally liable with big game for for attorney fees. So uh, it's one of those where it's like be really, really careful. Uh, because because if, if you're wrong and you lose it, in court, it, 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 at least have a viable argument. <laughs> That's the important part. If you have a viable argument, you're you're not going to lose uh, in big attorney fees. But um, if if you don't have a viable argument and the other side is, is kind of bringing you along, it's like, hey, you know, kind of, you know, support us and do this. Be careful. You know, have, have your attorneys take a look at this because uh, that's a hundred fifty thousand dollar mistake. Is you look at it, which because the attorney fees were only just for what happened at the district court level. So yeah, yeah, very good. We have one more question that someone asked uh, that uh, I said what I thought, but we'd like to know what you think. So I'm booking photos. Yeah, the, the Gary statements are. This is about the booking photos. Yeah. The change was, uh, uh, anyway. Will it include in box room and pre booking jail video as well? Yeah, I don't know the, Cause the exact law, language. Did, did they, they put that the in there? The law says the exact language. I, I was exact on my language slide. was. I don't have it. It's on my Whatever slide. she said. It says probably. It says. Uh, photos taken during the process of booking into jail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So they probably, you know, they put it into the statute. Garrity statements itself, obviously, are not. That it's not referenced. related to Garrity yeah. statements. It's Garrity statements were the statements by the officers, but, but they could be involved with that as part of the statute. They change. Sure. So the exact language is. Um, let's see. An image taken of an individual during the process of booking the individual into jail. Does that include the the in talks room and the pre booking jail? Probably video. Probably yeah. Yeah, we're going to say but yes. Always, you agree with but me, yes, right? Yes. But, but always consult with your attorney in case that question comes up. <laughs> so, okay. That's always a good thing. Okay. The other question is. And guarantee statements are for all government employees. Okay. Not just police officers. Great. Okay, it's so just it's that this police one. officers I keep looking up there. happen to be more likely to be in the line they of fire. Are, yes. Yeah. Literally okay. in the line of fire. So okay. okay. Janet Baker asks, can the booking photo be released if someone requests their own booking photo? I think it's under the protected, not under the private section. So it's three oh five. Yeah. So, so. If it was uh, but again, everything that's under three oh five is discretionary. If properly classified by a government entity, so you could have a government entity say, "It's your own photo. Here you go." I mean, so they can do that discretionary, but they don't have to because even right, though you're the subject of the record, yeah. it's a protected record as opposed to private record. So. Right. 
so that infringed upon your time to talk about the Open Meetings Act, but oh, that's, we'll that's let okay. you do that now. That's okay because we're gonna we're gonna actually kind of breeze through this fairly quickly because there really weren't that many changes and, and things we're done with this, so um, we'll, we'll at least make it quite interesting. So we'll uh, pull this up, share the screen. We love technology. Uh, Renee is our technology guru for today, and I just I just love that side. Balancing rock. It's just I'm, I keep using that one over and over again. And for those of you that have seen my presentations before, you see similar slides. I'm sorry, I've done this for 14 years. So, ooh, so I get to do the magic button, which will make things go. So here we are, legislative updates. This is you know the part where you just say, you know, we, this is exciting, um, yay. Um, why is this before lunch? Because this is so exciting. And yeah, why are you having a lawyer do this? Because, I mean, come on, it's lawyers. And uh, what can I say? It's happy, happy stuff. But really, the purpose of the presentation is to kind of go through and show some of the changes that were made in OTMA, which of course is Title 52, Chapter 4. Um, we're also going to review some of the changes that didn't quite make it, uh, because it's kind of funny as I talk to people, some people think, well, that was a change that was made. No, it was proposed, but it didn't actually go through. Um, so why exactly do we have OTMA? And uh, you know, since, since I uh, spent so much time in Ohio, I just had to put Ann Arbor, Michigan up here just for fun, because it's Michigan. Um, in the Utah Code, there is a declaration of public policy. It says the legislature finds and declares that the state, its agencies, and political subdivisions exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. And it's also the intent of the legislature that the state, its agencies, and its political subdivisions take their actions openly and then conduct their deliberations openly. Basically, you have a right to know what is going on with, with uh, the government. Uh, you do not want to have this type of situation where basically it was all in favor of what we discussed in our email thread and at Larry's son's birthday party, say I, 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 and there was a wink, wink, and nod, nod. And uh, you know, the people who are there at the meeting said, I thought this was mean an open meeting. So I have no idea what's going on. That is why we have Atma. We don't want to have things like that because if you're going to do your deliberations openly, you got to do it in the open so everyone else can see what's going on. But I think it's also very interesting that Atma and, and Grammar are very similar. Uh, both acts, they promote the people's right to know what's happening in government, uh, but also both acts outline instances where information held by government either discussed in a meeting or in a record may be kept non-public. Because there are some things that we want to have public, but then there are also other things that probably don't want to have public. Um, a good example, for example, a good example, for example, that was a double. Um, grandma completely excludes security measures. Uh, security measures are not included as, as records. And then also you have within Atma where it says if you have a discussion about what you're doing for the security, you could do that in a closed meeting. So for example, say, I don't know, you're in charge of the prison. You don't want to have all of your security measures for the prison as public records for all the inmates to get. And at the same time, you don't want to have the meeting about where all the security measures are as a public meeting so everyone can know where all those security measures are. You can see how to kind of work together. Um, Sunshine Laws is, is how we basically describe both Atma and also um, Grandma, because the idea is that uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. We want people to know what's happening with government. So here are the ones that we've changed. <laughs> this first one, and this actually probably made the most changes. And in a lot of these, I'm, I'm just going to say, you're going to have nothing to do with them. Nothing, you, you, you know, chances are about this big that you'll, you'll have anything to do with any of these changes. But we're going to cover them because we're thorough and we want to do everything possible to make sure you understand them all. And one of these is definitely Senate Bill 92. Because uh, it adds to the definitions that a public body includes a project entity as det determined in 11.13.103. And then also public bodies not include a tax interlocal, interlocal entity if it's not a project entity. So of course the question is, what's a project entity? I'm sure all of you are completely familiar with that. Well, I looked it up. And a project entity is a Utah interlocal entity or an electric entity that owns a project as defined in the section. Keyword is interlocal entity, so we're doing an interlocal, and it also has to be a project. And the project is defined as an electrical generation, transmission facility, fuel facilities. Think uh, basically kind of basic utility type things uh, where you have communities that get together um, and they basically set up a government to take care of those things. So that means that uh, you have now in the closed meeting section, along with all important things such as the ethics committee, legislature, political subdivisions, you also now have a project entity 
<coughs> is also a closed meeting and it shall be done. Uh, it may be done in this case. So that is what it is when you open up your uh, uh, Atma and say, oh my goodness, why did 204 expand out? It's for these project entities that you will probably never have anything to do with unless you're very, that, that's very small amount, but it's there. It is there as of this uh, section. And it all even made a change and the following meeting shall be closed. The meeting project entities shall be closed in these type of things. So have fun if you want to take a look at those. Probably not going to have that come up. Elected public body transparency amendments. Now this one is something that's a little more, uh, might be more involved. Um, in the written minutes of open meeting, uh, it now has it at C, a public body that has members who are elected to the public body shall satisfy the requirement in 2A4, when you look up 2A4 as a record by individual member of each vote taken by the public body. It's a by category for each action taken by member, including yes, no votes and absent members by each member's names. In other words, we want to make sure that we know exactly where the votes are for everyone. That's an important thing. And so we've now put it in statutes uh, to make that there. But we've also included this with electronic meeting requirements. And this got changed around a little bit, but just emphasizing again, you need to know how people voted, but then also giving notice as necessary for public meeting. Uh, Department of Government Operations, um, that is what we're part of with archives. Um, we also had a few things were changed with Senate Bill 15. And one of the things uh, was also involving, uh, again, a closed meeting. We're going to see a theme here. A closed meeting may be held if, and this one's for the Data Security Management Council. This kind of makes sense where you're going through and talking about data security and how we're managing it. We want to keep that meeting closed. And so what is the Data Security Management Council? Well, it's made up of the Chief Information Officer for the state, someone from the governor's office, someone, a speaker office, a highest ranking technology official, the Judicial Council, Utah State Board of uh, education, the Board of Higher Education, Tax Commission, and the Attorney General's Office. Basically, this council is one that it goes across uh, all three branches of government to make sure that we have data that is secure and they can close our meetings. Student eligibility and interest scholastic activities, because again, if we want to close a meeting, let's just stick it in here with everything else. The following meeting shall be closed, and uh, you'll notice that some of these are the same numbers and letters. When they put all these together, they'll change them around, but at least when they were proposed, they'll show up here. But meetings for school activity eligibility commissions, uh, those can also be closed, going along with Colorado River Authority and conservation districts and yeah, opioid people. So they get put in the list because that list just keeps longer. It's almost like 63G-2-305. That list is going to get longer and longer. Yet another one, regulatory sandbox program amendments. Let's stick this in the list. Also, following meeting shall be closed, a meeting in the General Regulatory Sandbox Program Advisory Committee. Um, those are also now going to be closed meetings based upon the 2022. Uh, Point of the Mountain State Land Authority Amendments. What do you think is going to happen to this one? Yep. We're going to go have, uh, have change it in here and say that if you have to discuss proposed development agreement projects, proposal or finance proposal related to the development of land owned by the state, which Guess what? That just happens to cover that entity. We are now going to allow that as a closed meeting. So we get an ever longer list of things. The list just close. keeps getting longer. It's uh, very specific mm -hmm. ones. Uh, Senate Bill 190, Medical Cannabis Act Amendments. Guess what? Uh, as it relates to, you can have a closed meeting for it as well. <clears throat> so if you were part of any of these entities, congratulations, you can now close your meeting. Just look at the statutes and see what the changes are. Oh, that's something they've done. Now, of course, with COVID, COVID had some changes. And I, I don't know why this is one of my favorite pictures, but basically it was when COVID came through, the world closed. But this is the world theater, but we just kind of felt like everything closed. But it also meant that we changed the way we did things. We have more electronic meetings. And, and as such, we're seeing some things happen in both Grandma and also Atma that reflect some of these uh, electronic meetings. And so we had uh, the Open and Public Meeting Act modifications, and this is probably one of the more uh, general things that apply to most everyone with the HB 22 uh, because it also says uh, again that a resolution rule or ordinance that governs electronic meeting held after December 31st 2022 which means you've got a little bit of time to do this you will establish conditions under which a remote member is included in calculating a quorum. They just want to make sure this is uniform across the board uh, for all entities if they're doing electronic meetings. 
And uh, down in five, they added this. If the public body is statutorily authorized to allow a member of the public body to act by proxy, you have to establish the conditions under which a member may vote or take action other, or other action by proxy. So there are actually some out there that say, if you can't make it to the meeting, you can send a proxy for it. Well, you need to put that in the rules because if you're doing everything by electronic, how do you know who it is that's actually there? So make sure you have your, your things put in. You have to do it before December 31st, 2022. Um, and they also added this at the very end. Unless a public body adopts a resolution, rule, or ordinance described uh, above, a public body that is conducting an electronic meeting may not allow a member to vote or otherwise act by proxy. So you need to make sure it's in the rules to be able to allow members to vote if they're uh, attending electronically. Put that in there. Uh, and again, 2CV was back there. Uh, if public bodies are allowed, they can do that. So, And then also, except for a unanimous vote, a public body is conducting an electronic meeting shall take all votes by roll call. So you have to kind of go down the line and ask for each one because we're running the situation where people just, uh, we don't know who voted. Everyone's like, all in favor, aye. All opposed, nay. And the person who's like still trying to put their, their button off mute, you have no idea what they wanted because you didn't hear them. And so if you go through by name, then you know exactly who it is that voted for what. Um, and that's, that's going to include, a you know, if it's unanimous, then it's pretty easy. But except for that, you really need to make sure you take the votes by call because otherwise you have no idea what's happening. Now, this is one of my favorite parts, bills that didn't quite make it to becoming law, but uh, were rumored to have become law because this one was my favorite, was HB 135, the Open and Public Meeting Modifications. Um, Brady Grammer, I love him so much. He's, he's our representative and he's an attorney, so we have fun and I have fun with him on this one because one of the things, well, here's the votes you can see, it just, it just never made it. It just failed in the Senate a couple different times there. Um, didn't get very far. <laughs> And, and the section that was going to be changed was a public body holding meeting is open to the public shall allow a reasonable opportunity for the public to provide verbal comment. Well, that opened a whole bunch of can of worms. Uh, even the state records were like, shall allow opportunity for people to make comments. I mean, the, the, the problem that they were running into was that some, shall we say, cities were just simply saying, nope, no public comment, can't have anything. So what do you do when you have a problem? You get your legislature to pass a law. That's, it, it's that simple. Well, it's not that simple, actually, um, is that if you all of a sudden have this blanket policy for all public bodies, you have to allow verbal comment during the meeting. Well, how many people do you allow that for? Is it for one? Is it for two? For ten? Uh, all of a sudden, your meeting becomes nothing but a public comment meeting, and you never get anything done. So that's kind of the big reasons why it, it didn't go through. Uh, the legislature supports the idea. You want public comments, but we don't want public comments overwhelming your meeting, which is important. Um, and besides that, another part is, is one of those great things is sometimes legislature, you propose certain things and it ends up in another bill. Because HP 439, there's another part of the bill that uh, was changed over. And if you notice, this language is exactly the same as what was in HB 439. So even though that section about the public comment was taken out, the other parts that were making changes was adopted. And the last one we're gonna look at is the Open and Public Meeting Act Violations, HB 285. And this is one of those that ended up being a little too broad um, let's just say it didn't go any place at all, but, um, and, and, and what happened was is they wanted to uh, basically say a member of public body who knowingly or intentionally excludes from an open meeting a member of the public who has a right to attend the open meeting is guilty of a class C misdemeanor. And kind of looking at that, they thought that might be a little harsh because the idea was, well, we want people to be involved, but at the same time, we can't make it that harsh, which is why it didn't, yeah, we didn't make it a criminal violation, so. So again, when we're looking at ATMA, we're doing the balancing test between things because it's very similar to, to ATMA. Uh, but at the same time, the grand takeaway is ATMA continues to change. Certain meetings need to be closed and certain meetings need to be open. And how many take place involved with technology. So, all right. Well, thank you, Paul. No problem. Are there any, any questions? Because this is not rocket science. We'll just ask for any questions at this point. 